Good day, I'm Professor Robert Dunn. Welcome to the orthopedic module for fifth year's MBCHB. This talk deals with speaking orthopedic surgery. Your learning objectives from this talk is to recognize and describe fracture, morphology, and dislocations, as well as resultant deformity. Consider this diagram. What bone is this? Many of you will confuse this with the humerus, but quite clearly this is a femur. This can be recognized by the long shaft, the trochanter, and typical condyles. Which side? This is a left-sided femur due to the anatomical position of the patient facing you. We refer, we refer to proximal, being closest to the body, distal, furthest from the body, Synonymous with proximal is cephalid. Synonymous with distal is caudal. We also use the terms epiphysis, which is the area proximal to the physis, metaphysis, and diaphysis, which is synonymous with the shaft. Equally, there will be another metaphysis, distally, and epiphysis. The epiphysis are inside the joint. These are important terms when coming to describe lesions on x-ray as certain infections and tumors who have a predilection for certain areas. Consider this diagram where you can see a fracture. This fracture is transverse in morphology. We would describe this as a transverse fracture of the mid shaft of the left femur. Note that the morphology has now changed. This is referred to as an oblique fracture. And we would term this as an oblique fracture of the mid shaft of the left femur when reporting this to colleagues. The morphology now is that of a spiral fracture, again termed a spiral fracture of the mid shaft of the left femur. This morphology indicates that the injury was that of a torsional or twisting nature. Should this patient give a history of a direct blow, it would be inconsistent with this morphology. A direct blow will result in a transverse injury, occasionally with a butterfly fragment on the contralateral side. A long spiral oblique injury indicates twisting or rotation, typical of twisting the upper limb or running along and getting your foot stuck in a gutter or mole hole and the body twisting over the top. Here we can see irregular shaped edges with small bits and pieces of bone. This is referred to as a complex fracture of the mid shaft of the left femur, also termed as comminuted. This implies high energy. We know that energy is equal to half mass times velocity squared, and thus velocity has a much bigger impact on, on energy than mass. This has significant soft tissue considerations. Although we tend to focus on bone when looking at the x-ray, we must always remember that there's a soft tissue envelope around this bone, which provides not only function, but blood supply to the bones with an impact on its healing potential. In high energy injury, more damage will occur to the soft tissue. It may well be open, in other words, the skin is torn and exposed to the outside world. This will allow bacterial contamination and an increased chance of infection. Therefore, determining whether a fracture is open where the skin is damaged and the fracture is exposed or closed, the skin is intact, is important. In addition to the soft tissue disruption increasing the chance of infection, it also reduces the healing potential due to the damage to the vascularity supplying the bone. This diagram indicates displacement. We refer to this translation as a shift and we by convention refer to the distal fragment when describing this displacement. In this case we have a transverse fracture of the mid shaft of the left femur with lateral translation. This can be quantified by using a ratio. Due to the 10 to 15 percent magnification of the anatomy when x-raying patients. We prefer to use ratios rather than absolute measurements. Here you can see about 60% of the distal fragment's width 
has translated laterally. We would thus refer to this as a transverse fracture of the mid shaft of the left femur with a 60% lateral shift. This diagram indicates another deformity. There is no shift, there is still continuity of the cortices, but there is an angular deformity. We refer to this deformity as tilt or angulation. Again, convention dictates that we refer to the distal fragment. We can quantify this by measuring, drawing lines down the, uh, mid down the mid shaft of the respective fragments and working out an angle. We would thus refer to this as a transverse fracture of the left mid shaft of the left femur with a 30 degree medial tilt or angulation. This example combines the two deformities. You can now see that there has been a medial translation or shift as well as a medial angulation. We would refer to this as medial tilt and shift, thus a transverse fracture of the mid shaft of the left femur with medial, not lateral, medial tilt and shift. Here's an example of a 100% medial shift where there has been proximal migration. This is referred to as shortening. This can be quantified using uh, measurements. In this case, it's difficult to use a ratio and we'd probably use an absolute number of one to two centimeters, accepting that we're going to be 10 to 15% incorrect due to magnification. Remember, we live in a three-dimensional world. That's why we always take multiple sets of x-rays. We take a minimum of two views orthogonal to each other, in other words, 90 degrees to each other. By convention, we do an AP or an anterior posterior x-ray, which is the diagrams I've been showing you up to now, which is from the front to the back of the patient. And then we take a 90 degree orthogonal view called a lateral, which is from the side of the patient. So this diagram indicates a patient where there is medial shift and tilt, and here's a lateral view where the distal fragment, note the patella, is anteriorly angulated and shifted, which results in medial tilt and shift and anterior tilt and shift. Now, this leg can only be in one position at one time. These x-rays are done without moving the patient. These represent what the deformity looks like in this respective plane, but obviously the vector needs to be calculated, and this patient's leg would be lying in an antromedial position. Here's an x-ray of an immature skeleton. This can be identified due to the growth plate still being open in the proximal tibia, proximal fibula, distal femur. And fracture has occurred through the growth plate and through the bone. Due to convention, we will describe this as a, because this is now the right side, this is a lateral shift and tilt. One may know the, note the additional fracture into the epiphysis over here. This being the epiphysis, this being the metaphysis. Very clear in a child because the physial growth plate is still obvious. Here there is a fracture through the growth plate and the bone, and you can see that the distal fragment has gone posteriorly. It shifted posteriorly and tilted posteriorly. What about joints? What joint is this? Clearly we have a scapula and a humerus. So this is the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint. Again, this is the left-hand side. By convention, the patient is facing us. Many of you will confuse this with dislocation. But the definition of a dislocation is complete loss of articular or joint surface contact. Here there is still some contact between the, glenal, the, the, the glenoid, glenoid and the humeral head. This is termed a subluxation and in this case inferior because the distal fragment, the humerus, has gone inferiorly. This is what a dislocation would look like. You might argue that the head is no more lower or no more inferior than the previous view, but is clearly overlapping the glenoid. It cannot overlap the glenoid unless the glenoid has impacted into the humeral head or is a dislocation. Here's an example on an x-ray where you can see the glenoid 
glenoid over here with the scapula and the humeral head sitting anterior to the glenoid. Because we take two views, this is an AP, anterior, posterior, and a lateral, you can here see the open glenoid on the scapula with the humeral head anterior to it. This is an example of an anterior dislocation. This patient would come off the rugby field holding his painful arm externally rotated due to the deformity. What is going on here? Again, we have the scapula, glenoid, with humeral head seemingly in anatomical position. To those of you with a keen eye, you will notice a change in the way I've demonstrated the humeral head. It is now round. If we go back one, you'll see there was a different shape. That shape showing the tuberosity. Yeah, completely round. This is an example of a posterior dislocation. The head is rotated out the back. This is more common in epileptics and those that suffer electrical shocks. And we refer to this as a light bulb sign from the old incandescent light bulbs uh, that looked in a very similar shape. Coming on to the spine. Here you can see I've drawn the vertebral bodies from the side laterally with a superior articular process, inferior articular process, and a spinous process. You can see how the superior articular, sorry, the inferior articular process of the one above sits behind the superior articular process of the one below, like roof tiles. Here's an example looking from behind in the neck, and you can see the inferior articular process sitting on top and covering the superior articular process of the one below like roof tiles so the rain can't get in. Here's a lateral view looking from the side. You can see the inferior articular process sitting above the superior articular process like a roof tile. These are called facet joints. And in injuries to the cervical spine, these can be dislocated. They can be difficult to, to identify, but very important to have emergent management as this can make the difference between long-term quadriplegia and recovery. A unifacet dislocation. Remember, there are two facets. Just going back to the previous slide, there is a, there is a facet on either side of the spine. A, a left-sided facet and a right-sided facet. We're looking from behind now. Left-sided facet, right-sided facet. On x-ray, they'll look super, superimposed. You'll only see one, like you're seeing in this picture here. I've drawn that so you've got two superarticular processes in alignment. When you get a unifacet dislocation, there is a rotation. Therefore, the, set, the facets will rotate and you'll see the far-sided one more anterior than the other, or it could be the ipsilateral, but there's a difference in rotation. One's jumped over. So the two of these are still in alignment. These two have twisted, one's jumped over. You'll pick this up by a apparent anterolysis of about 25%, so the body will appear to have um, slid forward by about 25%, and there will be an unmasking of rotation of the facets. So inferior, you will see the superimposed two facets in alignment, and where the facet has dislocated, you'll see the difference over there. Here's a clinical example. You can see the gross dislocation over here. When looking very closely, you'll notice that there is a facet over there. The superarticular process over there is still in contact with the inferior articular process over there. Whereas the inferior articular process here has jumped from there. It should be over there. If we look at a closer view, you can see here is your so-called bow tie sign, which is indicative of spinal obliquity. In this case, we're seeing rotation on the bottom one as opposed to the top one. The importance, it can, there's a difference in rotation. It doesn't necessarily have to be the top or bottom. It really depends how the radiographer has taken the x-ray. But here you can see a supraarticular process, inferarticular process, supraarticular process, inferarticular process giving us the bow tie sign. One doesn't have to remember that, but you will hear it from time to time. But the important thing is you've got two facets over here. They're no longer superimposed, whereas these two are almost superimposed because they're still lateral. So there's a difference in rotation between this vertebra and this vertebra. That one and this one are still intact. That one and this one are dislocated. This is a unifacet dislocation.
Don't forget our other view, our AP, where you can see the virtual bodies. You can see the spinous process, spinous process, spinous process. And if you draw a line up through the spinous process, you'll see there's a deviation. And this is indicative of a rotation or unifacet dislocation. Here's a gross comparison of a bow tie sign with the facets on the top and now fully reduced. This is part of a reduction process occurring here, which we'll teach you about in another lecture. In contrast, a bifacet dislocation will have a greater degree of anterior lysis. It would have, both facets would have jumped over the supraarticular facet, therefore restoring the normal rotation, again superimposing its facets. So it will not appear to have the, the um, dislocated or rotated position that you saw in the unifacet. Lastly, we refer to the words valgus and varus. Valgus would be a typical example of the knees where the distal fragment goes laterally like this, there's valgus, varus, it comes internally. It can be quite difficult to remember and a very easy way of remembering it is that if you imagine chasing a pig down the passage and you speak of Ricard's, when the pig runs through your legs and away and you look down between your legs, you say varus de falc, varus, where the varus being big enough for the pig to run away. Something simple to remember if you battle. Uh, that's the end of this uh, lecture. Um, you're welcome to contact me should you have any queries about this. Thank you.